two down. Bottom of the ninth. Game is tied. Taylor calls his shot. There's the pitch. Hey, take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I never get back. Ah, baseball. That beloved game, long considered America's national pastime. Why? Well, maybe because it's a happy harbinger of springtime with its promise of longer days and warmer nights. Maybe it's the way it stirs up joyful childhood memories of sliding into second base or cheering for dem bums from the cheap seats. Could it be because the game comes with an unending supply of peanuts and Cracker Jack? Well, whatever the reason, pretty much everyone has a fondness for baseball. Doesn't the smell of fresh green grass on an April morning just make you want to pick up a wooden club, swing it at something, then run away as fast as we... Ken. Okay, well, that sounds less like a sporting activity and more like the basis of a felony charge, but you know what we mean. Beyond the merits of the sport itself, baseball lends itself to all kinds of creative interpretations. Bugs may not be a fan, but we'll say this for baseball, it's certainly easy enough to understand. Well, then who's playing first? Yeah. I mean, the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? Well, most of the time. It's so easy, in fact, that there are some who think that compared to other sports, baseball's old-fashioned simplicity has begun to make it boring to watch. Uh, hello? <laughs> are you new? Baseball's always been a little um, sluggish. No, that's too harsh. Okay, uh, dull? No, not dull exactly. Um, hmm. How about typically slow-moving and generally uneventful for long, drawn-out periods of the game? Yeah, that's, that's it. What baseball lacks in speed and violence, it makes up for in form and elegance. At the start of the 2023 season, the sport implemented significant changes to enhance the baseball viewing experience. New rules went into effect that altered the way the game is played, including enlarging the bases, repositioning the players on the field, and even introducing a pitch clock, all in service of making the game more exciting. You know, spicing it up a bit, which has been controversial among diehard fans. Simplicity isn't a bad thing. In fact, YouTuber Patrick Willems thinks the relative chasteness of the game actually makes it the best sport to feature in movies. The game itself works better in cinematic form than any other sport. There is a history and culture that other games don't have that provide opportunities for a huge variety of stories. It's the best sport for comedies and the best sport for dramas. Baseball movies tell the story of a hundred years of American history. And also, people hit a ball with a stick really hard, and it's cool as hell. Willems goes on to say that the overall predictability and repetition, as well as the game's uncluttered nature, only nine guys to keep track of, with lots of room between them, make for a storytelling endeavor that is clean, clear, and camera-friendly. And it seems Hollywood agrees with him. Baseball movies have been a mainstay of the American film industry. As far back as 1898, the sport lent itself to this new form of entertainment. Thomas Edison, yes, that Thomas Edison, was responsible for a production entitled The Ball Game, which represents the first filmed footage of the sport. Admittedly, it didn't have much of a plot. In fact, it was just a real ball game between two local amateur clubs. But it was baseball on film, and back at the end of the 19th century. So that's saying something. Not too long after Edison's foray into the world of sports documentaries, two silent films on the topic of baseball were released. Little Sunset, and Right Off the Bat. Like Edison's effort, both films featured real-life ballplayers. In Little Sunset, the team for which the young title character is mascot was portrayed by a professional squad from the Pacific Coast League, the Vernon Tigers. Similarly, right off the bat, in essence, a biopic, was the dramatization of New York Giants player Mike Dunlan's life in and out of the Major League. Makes sense, right? Real players playing real players. After all, who better to make all that pitching, hitting, and inappropriate scratching of private parts look authentic and believable? It's an important job. Hiring the real deal seemed like a simple solve, but because Hollywood's box office bread and butter requires casting big name actors to play both fictional and non-fictional jocks, as the appetite for sports movies grew, the industry was compelled to find a way to turn actors into jocks, at least for the duration of the filming schedule. 
today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Soon enough, an entire vocation developed devoted to that very goal. We refer to, of course, the sports coordinator. Sports coordinators are like if Paula Abdul and Tony La Russa had a baby. Part coach, part choreographer, these hardworking individuals are the ones who make the movie games look genuine. They're often former sports professionals who work closely with the stars of a film, teaching proper skills and athletic nuance, not to mention mapping out plays on the field and facilitating communication between the less sports-savvy members of the cast and crew, such as producers and directors. You may never have heard their names before, but people like Mike Fisher, who worked on the business of baseball masterpiece Moneyball, and Amy McDaniel, who taught Jay Galloway to do a darn good Sandy Koufax meets Steve Carlton pitching impression in Clint Eastwood's Trouble with the Curve, have provided critical elements of realism to these films, as well as adding thematic depth by helping the actors connect the sports action to the core storytelling. How do I catch it? Just stand there and stick your glove on the air. I'll take care of it. There are a ton of baseball movies out there, but let's focus on three that we consider to be cinematic all-stars. They've earned the distinction for two reasons. One, because they speak to the deeper emotional truths associated with the institution of baseball, and two, because they boast as their star the one, the only, Kevin Costner. If ever there was a philosopher of baseball, it's this man. A former high school player, Costner was never what anyone, himself included, would call an MVP but he could definitely play the game. So when it comes to deserving a spot on the genre's starting lineup of relatable, resonating characters, it is our opinion that this guy holds the league record. Leading off, we've got 1988's Bull Durham, a baseball movie pinch hitting as a romance, complete with a love triangle, or perhaps more accurately, a love diamond? Because not only is there an irresistible attraction between Nuke's girl, Annie, the quirky sports groupie played with sensual eloquence by Susan Sarandon, in Costner's charming Just This Side of a Has-Been Triple-A Catcher, Crash, there's another elusive seductress whom everybody's got the hots for. And that's the game of baseball itself. Crash essentially recites an ode to his dalliance with the Major League. Yeah, I was in the show. I was in the show for 21 days once. 21 greatest days of my life. You know you never handle your luggage in a show? Somebody else carries your bags? It's great. You hit white balls for batting practice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ballparks are like cathedrals. The hotels all have room service. The women all have long legs and brains. <laughs> and an entire generation of 80s ladies fell hard for Costner the minute he opened his mouth to deliver this memorable little speech. The small of a woman's back. The hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, that the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, soft core pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. The sense of truth and insiderness that permeates Bull Durham comes from the fact that writer-director Ron Shelton was himself a semi-pro infielder, and the script was based on his personal experience. Mostly I thought that nobody ever got sports movies right, that they were always told from the point of view of the fan. I wanted to write a movie that got into the dugout and into the buses and into the shower and went out to the mound to hear what they actually talked about. It's like having the seats behind home plate a season ticket holder's view of what the game is really like, what happens after the stadium lights go dark, and what the game means to those who love it, fans and players alike. It's a glimpse into the camaraderie, the rivalry, the hard work and pure fun the game inspires. And also, seeing Tim Robbins trying to figure out how to wear women's lingerie is just plain funny. I was naked, playing naked. I know. I know, I have that dream all the time, too. A year later, Costner turned his first baseball movie at bat into a mini hitting streak with Field of Dreams. First, a shout out to the late, great Ray Liotta as Shoeless Joe Jackson, who posthumously turns Costner's character's life upside down. Now, let's be honest. The premise of Field of Dreams is a little um, out there. 
Ray Kinsella, an Iowa farmer who hears voices, takes a leap of faith and turns his money crop into a ball field, you know, for ghosts. Then he attends a PTA meeting where talk of possible book banning leads him through perhaps the flimsiest compilation of clues ever to kidnap a curmudgingly beatnik era novelist played by Darth Vader and take him out to a ball game. So you are kidnapping me? I have to take you to a baseball game. You what? Tonight's game. Red Sox A's. Why? Something will happen there. I don't, I don't know what, but we'll find out when it does. And while the farmer's brother-in-law is a bit of a wet blanket about the financial risks of Ray's endeavor, the audience never questions any of it. Not the spooky, if you build it, they will come mantra. Not the paranormal ramifications of a cornfield doubling as a heavenly portal. Not even the utterly unexplained plot contrivance of a time-traveling physician from Minnesota whose second chance at sports stardom is at the mercy of a chalked baseline. We buy it all. And we buy it as eagerly as we'd buy an overpriced team pennant in a $9 beer at the Fenway concession stand. Why? Because as Darth Vader, uh, uh, I mean, James Earl Jones, so poetically espouses, The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has ruled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. Baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, is a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good, and it could be again. And if that weren't enough to get you in your feels, there's this. Is this heaven? It's Iowa. In this. For the love of the game happened a full decade after that heart-tugging catch between Ray and his old man, and although Costner's character, Billy Chappell, is as sympathetic a major leaguer as there ever was, critically and box office-wise, this film was not technically an all-star. In fact, it was kind of a mm, disappointment, but we're pretty comfortable throwing a curve on this one and calling it a win for a few specific reasons, so hear us out. This time, Costner plays an injured pitcher on his way out who's pitching what might be his final game ever. Just let me sit for that juice. Warm me or something. I'll throw a little harder than usual today. There's your warning. Chap, don't throw it away too early. Today I'm throwing hard, guys. The audience really has a chance to get inside his head, which is interesting for baseball fans because who among us hasn't wondered what goes through the mind of a seasoned pitcher at one of the most important moments of his life? Turns out, this guy's thinking about his ex. <laughs> is it sappy? Well, maybe a little, but we think it works. The movie juxtaposes Billy's final appearance on the mound with memories of his relationship with the one who got away, Audrey, the love of his life which is all the more poignant because he's reflecting on this relationship in the same moment that this career may be ending. So entranced is Billy by his own romantic reminiscing that he doesn't seem overly invested in the fact that he's on the verge of pitching a perfect game. Remember we mentioned philosophy? Well, there it is, <laughs> cause why not? In that moment when this exhausted 40 year old veteran of the game comes face to face with the indisputable power of youth, what else is there for him to do but throw the damn ball. And isn't that what life comes down to anyway? Throwing the damn ball until you can't throw the damn ball anymore? For the love of the game is a story about doing your best for as long as it's in you to do it, and then knowing when it's time to quit. Because that time does come, baseball fans, and not just to major league pitchers. And rather than dishonoring the game he reveres, Chapel opts to walk away for the love of the game. This is a film about looking back at the scope of your life and recognizing that it's okay if your best days are behind you. It's about understanding that joy and regret don't always balance out. Hmm. No wonder this movie didn't make a bigger splash. It's kind of a downer, despite Chapel's triumphant finish. For the Love of the Game is a moving story in which choices are examined, outcomes are weighed, decisions are made, and yes, tears, so many 
<clears throat> Tears are shed. You saw it? It was the bunch of Yankee fans. Grown men crying. It was... perfect. These three movies aren't just about the mechanics of baseball or the cult of sports celebrity. They are about those things, sure, but to a greater extent, they're about the way baseball can underscore the human condition and show us things about ourselves. You might be rolling your eyes and muttering, of course, yes, the dreaded sports metaphor. And you're not wrong. But metaphors are metaphors because they work, and these movies don't just celebrate a game, they explore the magnitude of one sport's cultural appeal and how it informs us as a society. Think about it. We Americans have always loved our sports. Even during the most difficult times in our collective history, we've always been a people who prioritize our right to cheer the talents of others, to excel at something challenging, and to just go out and play. Of course, the all-star Costner team of films are hardly the only great baseball movies out there. Here's a quick look at the stats from some that delve into the history of the game and the nostalgia that surround it. For that reason, we're calling them our old timers. <laughs> so clever. For the record, this isn't a ranking, rather a random batting order of movies based on real life players or situations. Think of it as a kind of cinematic box score for quick and easy reference. Okay? Why screw around you guys? If the guy can play ball, he can play ball. I mean, let's get him on the team. In 1992, John Goodman transformed himself into the greatest and perhaps most complicated ball player of all time. You never heard of Salt in a Swat? The Titan of Terror. Colossus of clout? The Colossus of clout. The king of crash, man. So? I lied. Oh, yeah, the great Bambino. Of course. The Babe is a dramatic look at the life of George Herman Ruth, and to say it doesn't balk at showing the darker aspects of the legend's life would be an understatement and a half. Overall, Goodman's acting is a home run, but it's hard to get past the film's focus on Ruth's inclination to self-sabotage. In this iteration, the hero is seen as a man either unable or unwilling to get beyond his own origin story. Unfortunately, the movie grounds out for an excess of mawkishness and not enough attention to realistic detail with regard to its on-screen baseball moments. Let's say we uh, leave this joint and go fill a bathtub full of ginger ale. Not until the season's over. <laughs> and if we learned anything from 1992's A League of Their Own, it's this. Say it with us now. There's no crying! There's no crying in baseball! In this based on a true life tale, the boys of summer become the girls of wartime, taking to the field as members of the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. And with those girls being played by the likes of Gina Davis, Rosie O'Donnell, and Madonna, you can see why this movie was a grand slam. Tom Hanks is perfectly imperfect, and his evolution from spoiled, chauvinistic superstar to big brotherly mentor is heartwarming to watch. The baseball scenes are all the more exciting because of the girl power vibe. When it comes to showcasing women's sports with both humor and respect, this film wins a pennant. We're gonna win. We're gonna win! <laughs> In 2001, just three years after Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa spent a whole summer attempting to outswat each other to break the long-standing single-season home run record, Hollywood took us back in time to watch Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle engage in the same historic battle. The year was 61, and so was the number of home runs they were going for. <laughs> nice when art imitates life, isn't it? Definitely made the title a no-brainer. Highlights of this game include the fact that Billy Crystal directed it, and that Thomas Jane and Barry Pepper as Mantle and Maris, respectively, do a powerful job of bringing us into the hearts and minds of their very dissimilar characters, while navigating the tensions that come with being rivals as well as friends. You know, when I first came up, I was under so much pressure from Casey and everybody telling me I was going to be the next Joe DiMaggio. And uh, they gave me number six, right? Ruth was three, Gary was four, DiMaggio was five, and me, number six. I hated that being in line with the other guys, and a press, man, they was all over me. 2013 brought us the story of Jackie Robinson in the stunningly emotional 42. As Robinson, the first African American to play Major League Baseball, a pre-Avengers Chadwick Boseman brings equal parts determination and vulnerability to the role. No comic book superhero ever had nor required the amount of courage Robinson displayed in those early days of change in America's sports. And Boseman keeps his eye on the ball when it comes to embodying Robinson's stoic grace and unfaltering bravery. 
The movie's triple play is Harrison Ford as Branch Rickey, Chris Maloney as the iconic Leo DeRocher, and Alan Tudyk, who delivers a truly stomach-turning, rage-inspiring moment as the heinously racist manager of an opposing team. The MVP of 42 is, of course, the gone-too-soon Bozeman, who salutes Mr. Robinson through a performance rich with sweetness, grit, integrity, and hope. Fitting that the late Bozeman was the actor to wear Robinson's Brooklyn Dodgers jersey, the only one ever to be retired across the entire league, because he wore it just as Jackie did, with pride, conviction, and self-respect. You give me a uniform. You give me a, a number on my back. And I'll give you the guts. Hey, look at that. It's time for the seventh inning stretch. Perfect time for us to tip our baseball caps to a few of the other baseball movies that have charmed and entertained us over the years. A little organ music, please. Eight Man Out was a movie all about Julius Joe. Major League's wild thing made us cheer. Bad News Bear showed us kids drinking beer And then Roy Hop struck out the whammer Just three awesome pitches he threw Yes, it's lights, camera, action, play ball at a theater near you Play ball! Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe and hit that like button